Hey, brother. Ooh, hey, little brother. <laughs> <laughs> Where are My shaggy big brother. You look shaggy, man. I love it. That's fucking great. That means you're rocking out. You're busy, man. You're like, yeah. <laughs> it's fucking great. No, no insult to homeless people, but yeah, that's the homeless. <laughs> no, the September storm is working, man. You, you you called it. You said as soon as the kids are back at school, I'm going to fucking own that shit. I, I uh, As promised. But- like you, I, I think uh, you had to go take a shower. So did I, because the thermonuclear <laughs> furnace that is my guitar amp in that small room downstairs had me. <laughs> <laughs> you got radioactivity coming out from the. <laughs> Holy from the shit, that thing, man. Yeah. How There's, many tubes are in there? A thousand tubes or fucking <laughs> something like that. <laughs> <laughs> the fucking sound must be good, though. Once it's nice I, and hot, like just. I <sighs> was, uh, it was, it was a good morning. It was a productive morning. I did another mix on uh, our little duet. And yeah, uh, yeah. Later, awesome. Uh, I fixed the one I sent you yesterday. Colors there, everybody. It's called colors for now until I change it. Yeah, uh, love it. I, fixed it. I, I I sort of copy pasted, chopped it up, and okay, okay. It's in our loot folder. <laughs> Keep it coming. Keep it coming. Oh, it's up in uh, Dropbox. Okay, cool. Yeah, I haven't yeah. looked. I haven't looked. I've been doing yeah, other yeah, shit. It, it, I I think it's something that could you can work with right away. Like I like I say, I'm not sure about. The ending, but yeah. I'm just honored, man. Either way, like anytime that you're willing to share something with me to say, well, go ahead. And if you're allowing me into the bass realm, which is good. I love this dynamic that we got now. Whereas you used to say, yeah, yeah, you're doing the bass. Now you're like, no, hold on. I'm going to do the bass on this one, Tebow. You're going to do it on the next one, which is great. It's very selective. And I love that. No, but you're piecing it together with the true well, uh, you know, chapeau de production. It, That's fucking great, it, man. It, uh, I- I guess it's yeah the production hat where you know you play to our strengths and I this kind of song I just hear your bass playing on it. It's, I'm honored. I'm honored. There's no question. You know, I'm happy to oblige, man. Anything wanna, I can do, and then of course, wanna, as long as you're willing to throw it in the garbage if you don't like it. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry, you know that. And yeah, the reason I why I'm fighting with the, the amp is I was. I wasn't laying it down, but I was organizing uh, the next one that I'm sending off to Ken, which is the the Big E, the crazy hard <laughs> rock riff that uh, had me jumping around and almost breaking all the strings on the Les Paul. So I- <laughs> Did he solve all of his technical issues there, that, uh, that he broke stuff but yeah. fixed it by himself and he's coming around? <laughs> he's good. He's good. He's good. Uh, I awesome. should be getting tracks this weekend if all goes well. We're going to have to start fucking doing something like some content that involves him. Cause honestly, like the only time that we get a chance to really talk about him is here is when we're doing this and you know, on the, on the T bars on Friday, but we should include him in some way that not, the, not the fucking gaming thing, like in a real music sense, you know, like, I don't know. We'll have to figure it out. We'll have to, when I get a, actually get a track, maybe I'll, I'll, uh, you know, I'll dump the solo track up on, uh, on something and say, this is what I'm working with. Right. Okay. Well, here, this is the segue that I'd like to take an opportunity then. So Google search Uncle Fubar's garage for probably one of the last times ever that you'll have to do that. Because I know you, you're fucking investigating websites and social platforms of your own creation, maybe manipulating what exists already, Uncle Fubar becoming whatever it is. Uncle Fubar's garage is now more omnipresent than ever. Yeah. I forgot to send you the link this morning. I'll send it to you after this. (laughs) <laughs> oh, that's fucking fantastic! And, and we'll work. A, the website's up or no? No, you just, no, 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 there's no website. But uh, I, I wanted your opinion on what to do. So I got you. All right. So probably one of the last times that we'll have to say Google search anything because yes. there's going to be an actual fucking URL to send people. Definitely. Fuck. I'm stoked, yep. man. This is. It feels like a long time coming, but I know you're very methodical in your ways, and I appreciate that, man. Long fucking thinking, long-term thinking. So that's cool. So we, you've already mentioned, do you want to sort of just make a tiny list of the songs that you've already said, just to get people familiar with the names of the songs that you're about to start fucking throwing out there. The ones that are in progress now officially are? Uh, finished? Well, that's finished. finished or in progress that you're willing mm, to say. I, I still don't know if it's actually going to be called that, but The Wind, which we might change to Midnight. Uh, gotcha. Broken, all that I am. Um, right. Mirror. The vibe. What's next? Oh, Ken is working on one that's called Asylum. Okay, right. You're getting um, 
Colors. Colors. We'll call it colors for now, unless we, unless you can give me a better title. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. You know me, man. I'm not shy. I fucking screw around with all kinds of stuff. That's a six pack, man. Right there. That's a fucking six pack of originals for uh, for Uncle Fubar slash Apricot Sludge. We're halfway. Then there's uh, oh, there's another one I'm going to send you, but later after colors, I'm probably going to send it to you. I'll see if uh, Steve is up for another one. We'll talk when we get together. See if yeah. he wants more. Nice. That's coming up. Eh? It's in a couple of weeks, man. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully we'll have nice weather and uh, you know no snow on the ground. Yeah, we'll figure it out, man. We're always only de bruyale. We'll figure something out, no problem. That's fucking cool. The originals for Uncle Fubar are underway, man. Ah, I'm stoked. Like, September now, <laughs> fall has always been my favorite season. But yep. I think now more than ever, it just sort of like has this, this, this momentum to it. Now that we're doing the kind of stuff that we're doing, fall really has an impact. You know, musically, we start collaborating more. People come out of the woodwork. I don't know. Maybe it's the fear of winter coming. People are like, oh, my God, it's, you know, something I got to do it now. I got to take care of it. I have no idea. Oh, no fear there, man. I embrace it. <laughs> I know. Well, you fucking plow through it, man. No problem. <laughs> Literally. Literally. Figuratively, yeah. <laughs> right. I love it. I love it. Very cool, man. Where so, are we in morning? Is it morning. Morning. Yet? Morning is going to be, this is, this is the week of the final mix, man. Uh, like I was uh, saying last week, I got just some little leads, backup vocals, sound effects, real easy shit. The stuff that I can literally, I can start drinking before I track, you know? Whereas <laughs> the other stuff, the rhythm is like, have to, no, I got to be fucking on coffee, straight sober, so I can make it through. But now it's really the finishing touches, and I can spend the day. Thursday is going to be very telling. We're going to see if I'm able to get that final mix and you know me, like I've taken a page out of your book, wait until the Friday morning, the following day to first thing mix, you know, or get that edit, that last fucking piece. So yeah. that's, this is the week we're going to fucking fu do the final mix. And then you'll be the first to know, I'm going to send you two or three versions of it. So what do you think? What do you think? And then hit the button. I'm going for it on uh, distro kid. It will be the, the release platform for this one. And I want to talk to you sometime soon about the, the idea of, Having the, the distro kid slash CD baby release, but also having a free place for people to listen, not YouTube. What? I was thinking about this too uh, the other day. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> not, not like the way you phrase it, but I was thinking of if you want to release a freebie. Yeah. And it's not YouTube. Where the fuck do you release it? That's the thing. That's, I mean, I know that there's probably anyone who's watching this is screaming at the screen right now. Here, this is what, this is what you're going to do. Because I know probably there's SoundCloud. Sound yeah. That's what I was thinking. SoundCloud might be the, white, the right way to do it. But there's other options. And I just want to have sort of a unified approach to all of that. So you've got the yeah. official release. If people want to pay the fucking 99 cents, that's fine. I don't give a shit about that. I'm not fucking worried about the return on investment at all. I just want people to hear it. And to think that people have to watch the video on YouTube just to be able to hear the free song is fucking ridiculous to me. So I'm starting to get social platform conscious in that regard. Like, just let go ahead. Listen to it. When there's an album, if you want to fucking buy the vinyl version of the 12 song compilation. Oh, yeah, sure, man. Let's pony up the 40 bucks. But until <laughs> then, like, just That's go ahead. Also, Listen, you, know, you know, we have to start planning that Patreon account, too. <laughs> That's coming. That's coming. 12-hour streams on Twitch, Patreon accounts, all that fucking good stuff. Everything. So, yeah. And, you know, it's a, hey, I got to pay for this album. Copyright is 50 bucks a song. <laughs> or kick, Kickstarter campaign or some kind of thing. You know, like, I mean, whatever it is, whatever flavor that takes. And we'll get feedback from our, from our supporters, from our fans, too, to say, hey, why don't you do this? You know? There's a lot of good advice out there, so yeah, we got we got stuff to talk about. So morning is uh, in its final uh, mixing stage, and then the, of course next week will be the video, and then the bonus week of September is going to be going back to do the video for uh, for Silent Running. And did you um, have, oh wait, did you start the video for morning? No, 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 no. Okay. This this will be the last week of mixing and tracking and uh, mastering and then, whatever, and then uh, next week will be uh, video time. That's all. Going to have some fun. Everything's a fucking green screen in here. There's not one wall or piece Good of fucking dog. flat that has no green it's all there's green everywhere it's starting to rub off on my skin can you tell he's earthy plastic so are you all right speaking of turning green and not from not green. from envy 
What's that? That's, yeah, <laughs> that'll work. It'll work. It'll that'll work, man. Work, buddy. Trust me. You, you can totally do it. Not for long, man. It's a couple of months, and then it's all white screen. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, uh, my video shoot is in the planning stages in about two weeks. Right on, man. That's fucking cool. Oh, this is gonna be so cool, man. You're raising the bar so much. Everything is fucking coming together, man. I'm so I'm extra extremely excited for you and all of the stuff to come. Especially the website. That's going to be fucking crazy. Hey, yeah. by the way, I just got to tell you, man, I'm fucking like not pissed off, but just TikTok. Because, you know, me, I don't give a shit about views and, and numbers and all that. I, I, we care about it, but it's not like the driving force. TikTok is fucked. Yep. TikTok is broken. Yep. You know how we've had these incredibly ludicrous fucking things that have been successful on platforms. 30,000 views, 20,000 views. In the past Two weeks, I've posted, let's say I've posted 12 things on TikTok. Okay. At least half of them have views in the single digits. One, five, seven, and then back to back, 140, 350. Like, what the fuck? I have no idea what's going on with TikTok. Makes no sense. And here's the thing. So you know how much I love Spotify, right? I'm not going to do, I mean, I'm not, not going to pay lip service to Spotify to help them as a platform be yeah, successful exactly. when I can't even play my own fucking song in the truck on my phone. Like, okay, I'm sorry. I release it on Spotify out of necessity only. And even yes. that, I do it begrudgingly. TikTok, which used to be one of my favorite fucking places to go, watch content, find new creators, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Hearing about this, I won't say massive exodus, but there is an exodus of people that are leaving the platform and going to Instagram and YouTube and telling their million followers to come with them so yeah. that they can fucking not have to worry about TikTok bullshit anymore. How I'm many, not there, but yep, it's like... How right? many of the people we follow on TikTok have we gone, you know? Yeah. I think it's six now that I've... I've Okay, follow me on Instagram, no problem. Well, yeah. you know. You've mentioned it about, several times. <clears throat> I was about it's, to send another one this morning, you know? You yeah. say, well, they unbanned me, but they, they deleted... Right my videos and i don't have the wherewithal to start thinking about why or how or like no i'm too fucking busy i don't have time for that and i'm not too good for the fucking common man i'm just too busy to worry about why some massive fucking platform has done this in its fucking ability to provide support in any kind of way shape or form to creators yeah, yeah. youtube is reliable man i have analytics that are showing the climb exactly what section of the fucking video people stopped watching it thank you that is so helpful youtube is yeah. the best the best instagram yeah, is very close for analytics instagram tells me time of day which day of the week there's so many really? great things out there that are fucking yeah. useful and tiktok while they have all the same kind of tools they're just behavior in general which is unspoken you know what it makes is no sense makes no sense TikTok, the, 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 the big explosion of popularity has to do with how easy it is to use. Yeah. It's very yeah. usable. Whereas I agree. with Instagram, you know, okay, it's got to be that certain length, you know, like me. Like, I just realized that all the stuff I'm doing, okay, I can't post it that way. I got to post it the other way. But ends, even you and I talking and posting that every week, every week, Instagram, it's growing. Facebook, <laughs> Facebook for fucking retired people, is growing. Yeah, I know. YouTube is growing. Everything's growing. Every single platform that we post on, and I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not, I don't mean no, no. to be yelling at you or bitching at you. It's not your fault. No, no. I'm just saying, like, fucking TikTok makes no sense. How did I get to a 1,000 viewers like this, and then fucking, I'm at 1,800, and it's fucking stayed there, and now I have one view or five views on a fucking video that I post, like a dad joke. I've been posting dad jokes for fucking two years. Exactly. It makes no sense. If I'm getting shadow banned or if I'm getting takedowns for <laughs> pornography yeah, but because would, I'm fat. They would, send you, they would send you one of those, uh, you know, the, la vie. I don't even know anymore. I don't even know anymore. I don't oh, know. I bitching about, I post the same freaking video on the Soul Mason and I post it on the food bar. It yeah, gets six yeah. there, it gets five views there. It makes no sense. With the, with the exact I will tag. Like, yeah, what? I know. It, do, it doesn't make any sense. So I'm not going to say that I'm pissed or I'm upset or I'm angry because that's not true. I really don't give a fuck. It just means to say it's gone from being one of my favorite platforms of all time to being probably 
like as important to me as fucking Periscope, you know, like the video version of Twitter. I don't give a fuck about it anymore. That's- and yet I've got like, I've, you know, if I had a million viewers on TikTok, I would be pissed. Yes. I would be pissed. Exactly. So that's my, my, uh, my fucking soapbox for the day. I no, just have no idea if I don't get it. We're, we're cross pollinating all the fucking platforms now. <laughs> we well, we're busy. We're busy as fuck. And we're doing it on all the platforms, even Twitch, even Reddit. Like we're, Twitter. We're, we're busy, you know, Twitter, right? It's Twitter. That's still the, the, the one we're Twitter. not. I'm almost more excited about Twitter and you know how I felt about that my whole life. Yeah. I'm a shit, but yeah. I'm, I actually have people now on Twitter that I follow and that follow yeah. us that I care about. I genuinely care about them. And the ones that I used to feel that way about on, on uh, TikTok, I follow them on Instagram and YouTube, and I know where to find them. If I need to get in touch with any of those people, I know have, I have 17 places to talk, to talk to them. So, yeah, I don't know. That's my feeling about TikTok. Anyway, so moving on. Sorry to bitch about that so much, but no. um, I'm no. tracking my one track. for. I do one new track every week for the pub, pub rock sessions, and I'm working on Sympathy for the Devil. I'm working on my piano tracks, trying to get I that down. It. At the fucking it. guitar percussion. So it's getting there. It's coming along. Oh, yeah, because I, I went last night. And this is, this is a funny little segue. Just a quick thing before we talk about Jenny. Um, I was experimenting. I went live last night around 7.30 on, on Twitch just for fun because I'm thinking of adding a night where I just do editing on Twitch and people can yeah. come in and chat and whatever, and it's fun. So twice now it's happened where three times where I've got, we went with T-Bar and Ben. Ben yes. came in. And told us, I can't hear Enzo. Thank you. Fucking saved the day. I yeah. went live on a, either an acoustic or a pub rock session. Dave makes noises. Remember him? Jazz yes. cabbage guy. He yeah. came in and had cool. such great things to say and said, by the way, and he gave me just like engineering confidence. You know what I mean? Right. Saved the day again. Also, like uh, just, you know, this. Anyway, whatever. So what I'm trying to say is going live at the weirdest times and just randomly doing stuff and all of this support of, oh, by the way, try this. It's been helping me streamline the fucking streams and it's better than it's ever been. Our T-bar is going to benefit from it because I've learned around, you know, over the past month and a half how to make that shit work without having 17 windows open. So your voice is going to sound much better. Our (laughs) video is going to look better. The quality is going to be crisper. The stream fucking efficiency it's fucking getting there, man. We have a platform now. We got a place to fucking show off our stuff. And I'm excited more than ever before. So that's all I have to say about that. Did I forget to announce anything? What are we supposed to say? T-Bar on every Friday at 9 p.m. <laughs> Eastern is our chance to fucking vent and complain. I should have done all of this on T-Bar. I'm sorry about that. So <laughs> come and check us out on Twitch. Here's the link to the, the Twitch channel, T-Bow Vision. And Enzo and I go off on a fucking rampage every Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern. Tell me what you remember about our incredible guest, Jenny Morrison, from a few weeks ago when we interviewed her. The warrior queen. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, That's- I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A warrior queen. 100%. Totally. In all aspects of fucking life, no? <laughs> yeah. 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 She owns musically, real estate, fucking uh, D&D and entrepreneur and uh, like, you know, single mom and all of these Every- fucking things. She oh, just Everything. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She owns it. She owns it. And not afraid to try new stuff. She's doing this incredible initiative now where she's uh, a valiant fate is the name of her new uh, project where she's got her and a crew of incredible D&D players doing this weekly live stream. Um, and it's such a great show. The story's only getting started. And uh, she's just like, she's got fucking guts. She's got more balls than probably half the guys that we know. Seriously, it, it blows my mind. And I'm just so proud to include her as a list oh, yeah. of Tebow Vision friends. You know, she's, she's, about to, uh, some, she's up to some amazing stuff all the time, all the time. So there you have it. Now, this is interesting because it's motivation, too, for maybe one day helping, you know, as far as advice and what to do to start our own kind of gaming thing which since the interview with Jenny has given me some ideas uh, ah. and I'm looking forward to talking to her and a couple other people to see if we can't sort of formulate an idea or two for our own variant of that. Maybe not as cool or as polished at the start, but like Jenny has inspired me and others to do is don't be afraid to fucking try new stuff. So exactly. sky's exactly. the limit. 
<laughs> from Uncle Fubar's garage to yours. Let's get on with this episode. There it is, in live in the garage. <laughs> Here to man, fucking right. Ah, I love it. There you go. The hangout. Extraordinaire. So let's get into this interview with Jenny Morrison, guys. Here it is right now. Check this out. Jenny. Hey, Tibo. How's it going? Fuck, I'm such an idiot. Like, send the no. link, man. Wait, two minutes before. Oh, well, yeah. I'm going to send the link. That's the first time that's happened, too. Sorry. I'm sorry. And so hello, say whatever hello. you want, man. Fire your worst at me. I know. Where the fuck is the link? Duh. It's <laughs> all good. moment, man. <laughs> I just like yeah. Welcome yeah. Welcome to the most professional <laughs> podcast in the freaking podcast Bunch universe. Of bros, just gonna pour myself a little scotch. Uh, make sure the kids are secured. Uh, yeah, Where's the link? Where's the link? No, there's no fucking link. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask. Thank goodness. Hi, it's Jenny. Yeah. Hi, I'm Enzo. Enzo. I'm his Enzo. partner. Yeah. I, I've heard, heard you on the show. You bring yourself <laughs> down by associating you with me, bruh. Brah, don't, don't, don't do that. I'm still a little embarrassed right now. Sorry about that. All right, <laughs> it's all right. It no, I'll, get over, I'll get over it I've, next week. I have a feeling you've had a busy couple of days. <laughs> I have no excuse. I have no excuse. Okay. Atta boy, that's the stuff. Jenny, thank you for coming on board to Tebow Vision. <laughs> We're going to try and stay on course here, but I just have a feeling that, uh, I mean, there's so much stuff that we could talk about and go off on tangents. Just the wrestling alone is Enzo's forte. I'm not the wrestling guy, wow. but there's going to be some sidebars there. So anyway, I'll try and be the asshole and just keep it on focus, but really excited to talk to you today. You're doing so much cool stuff and what a freaking inspiration you are, man. So let's start way back at the beginning and the kind of stuff that you don't see in Instagram feeds and stuff like that. And insofar as you're willing to tell us, can you tell us about tiny Jen, like mini young you, <laughs> Before all of this stuff happened, before all of the cool, crazy stories, where did you grow up and what was it like? What are your memories of being a kid growing up before all of this stuff sort of took shape? You know, uh, I feel like I was very lucky to have such a cool childhood. Um, but I think like like everybody, there were there were certainly ups and downs and some extremely tumultuous moments. Uh, but in my childhood, I was I was left alone like all the time. Like I got to be by myself a lot. And and I think for some people that would be, you know, a, a big challenge. But it was something that I, I really grew to love as a child, just valuing being alone. And I got to spend a lot of time in my own head, you know, making things in my own mm -hmm. brain. Um, right. and, and so, and you guys are both nodding. So like you've been there and, mm -hmm. uh, and you have so, siblings? did you have siblings? I no. was just going to say, yeah. Only child. Uh, right. Yeah, I'm part child. of that club as well. I, yeah. I, I have an older sister, but we're 10 years apart. So I wasn't her little brother. I was like her kid, you know, she was, so I grew up with the teenagers, you know, <laughs> dragging them around. It was amazing. It was awesome. That yeah. is awesome. Yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, I was uh, left alone to my own devices a lot uh, to get into my own trouble and be unsupervised quite frequently. Very cool. um, and, and so I think that part of that is kind of, you know, who, what has shaped me into, into who I am today. It gives you a chance to really explore all kinds of different directions with trying to follow in the shadow of an older sibling or to have to be the responsible one that is taking all the bold adventures so that the younger sibling can just sort of benefit from that. You know, she got in trouble instead of me and all that. Yeah. So that's really I love that experience. And I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't know if it's the same for every only child, but it does give you that sort of breadth of my imagination can go bananas. There's no right. There's no wrong. So, yeah, that says a lot. And not having siblings, did you find that you were sort of seeking out so that sibling uh, connection through friends or through extended family, cousins and stuff? Was that, was that a part of your youth or did you enjoy that solitude? No, I think it kind of gave me like this unique independent streak uh, where I, you know, I don't need anybody. I don't want anybody. Um, <laughs> you know, there are times that I remember kids would come over and be like, hey, can, can, you know, can Jenny come out and play? And I'd be like, to my mom in the background, like, no, I'm not here. I don't um, want to share my fucking toys. No, yeah, I'm, I'm not here. No. Oh, and and so it, right. to the point where my mom and I even made up a code phrase um, so that she would <laughs> she would call me and say that I have to come home because I didn't want to play. I wanted to be by myself. Um, so we had a, a code phrase that we could use, you know, right call on. her up on the land, landline awesome. and be, come come get me. Thanks, mom. That's awesome. Yeah, Playing that's the same game. Pre-texting, uh, pre pre-cell phones and all that. So you had your lexicon. You're like, okay, 
Am I available? Yes or no? All right. Mom's got your back. (laughs) Fucking cool. I love it. Partner in crime. We know all about that. So, okay. Now, in that case, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask him at what point, because I'm not sure which is first, but I'm going to say, when was music? When did music become sort of an attraction to you? Like, how were you, how was the carrot dangled for you musically? Was it something that was an influence from your family or your own volition? My father was a professional musician for a long time. He went to University of Miami um, and studied music, um, was a jazz player in the Miami music scene. Um, in awesome. the, yeah, in the 70s and 80s and got to play with guys like Jaco Pastorius and, and players right like that. Um, Holy cow. Yeah. So uh, that was a, a, a big motivator. Uh, however, I didn't see a whole lot of my dad growing up. I didn't have him in my life very much. Uh, but one day on some random court mandated visitation that I didn't want to go to, I mentioned to him in the car. I was like, I was probably, gosh, I don't know, 10 or nine. And I was like, you know what? I want to wear high heels and put on crazy clothes and paint my face and play bass like Gene Simmons. And <laughs> just it's like an it's like an offhand comment to like get a rise out of him. Right. And he immediately pulled over the car, right? Like where we were driving, pulled into a shopping plaza, took me by the wrist into a pawn shop got me a $45 Chinese knockoff base off the wall, put it on me. It was taller than I was. And I was about to just tip like forward over because it was so heavy. This was like before they like, this was like a seventies instrument. They didn't Swiss cheese them then. And and I was was just falling forward uh, because it weighed so much. And he bought this cruddy seventies amp that was like re-soldered, had a new speaker that was like from somebody's car. It was horrible. Um, It's like all the shit I own basically. (laughs) Yes. Uh, I have plenty of, plenty of items like that behind me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, And he said, uh, Okay, then. And now you play the bass and uh, and drove me back to his house and got out a keyboard and sat there and taught me four chord songs that day so that I could start playing right away. And uh, and something about it, you know, you know, when you're a kid, you try a million things and sometimes shit sticks and sometimes nothing sticks Um, and and just something about it. It just stuck with me forever. That's fucking amazing. That's cool. Yeah, because usually, you know, the parents like, really? Are you sure? You know, think about <laughs> yeah, right. it. Go, let's go. Look. No, it's like. And then yeah. we go on for 15 minutes about the lamenting whether or not they wanted to play. And then they switch to piano. But you just hogged right in there, man. That's Dang, fucking epic. That's awesome. <laughs> good on you, Jenny. That's man, a cool you guys, story. You guys make me feel so good about it. I was listening to one of your older, ep- I guess it's not that old, one of your last episodes with Laura Boswell recently. Yeah, sure. And I was and I was like, man, she's so disciplined. Gosh, if only I could be that disciplined. If only I was that dedicated to my instrument. And I that's was like, exactly kick- what we were thinking. I was like <laughs> kicking myself. And I was like, man, what's wrong with me? Oh. <laughs> Jenny, I got a strat. I got one of my strats sitting in the corner over here. The pack of strings on the floor in front of it. It's a year and a half. They're there. It's a year and a half. And I'm like, to pick it up. Yeah. If you need feel good stories, man, we got a load of them. And by feel good stories, I, I, know, I mean, we I, will <laughs> show you how much we have not done and not accomplished. You're going to feel like fucking yeah, man, everything is good. But I don't yeah, think you no, suffer from that. <laughs> musical knowledge. Or, or the gift of creativity doesn't come from practice. I don't believe it just happens sometimes. What comes from practice is that fluidness of not searching. When you're like, you know, oh, okay, you know. Yeah. But when you're it's writing your own stuff, I mean, honestly, I. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the sky's the limit. You can do whatever the hell you like. Whatever. That's why originals you know? are like, you know, the double-edged sword. I mean, you can get away with murder, but when you really get good at it and practice the craft, then. <laughs> off you go man and yeah. no one's going to tell you you're doing it wrong it's my stuff what do you want to do I'm you're, doing you're right you, you're right i mean you you know you pull up the billboard top 10 and i'm like who listens to this garbage but like nielsen ratings are like pretty much everybody um yeah. and except for you jenny and probably <laughs> probably you guys and you know but yeah it's like these two chord songs right and they're uh and they're like totally overproduced and the greatest musicians in the world you know i teach music students music business students and uh they've never heard of Yo Yo Ma, right? They've never heard of of any of these musicians. It's, it's totally foreign to them. Yeah. Um, so it's it's just interesting. You guys are right. Like the the creative factor, the the market doesn't care about how disciplined you are or how great you are at your instrument. It's not a fucking shame. It's such a fucking shame. There is, there just, is, there's it's lost. It's, it's hardcore. Lost. I mean, you know, when Jeff Beck goes out on tour, he's still right. He has yeah. his, you know, 
yeah. it's there or the right, rush fans or the, you know, the dedicated Whatever, uh, you know? the 3G summit, you know, when you're going to see Yngwie and the gang, you're like, okay, oh my sure. God. Absolutely. I mean, it's, <laughs> it exists, but it's not mainstream. It's definitely not mainstream. Yeah, right. You're Yngwie, not hearing that show on the radio. Isn't, right? isn't a household name, but somehow Migos is, right? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. I don't want to get angry about it, but let's just say we're, <laughs> we're very, we're very much on a close same page in that book. <laughs> I think. You know, I, I keep saying, I try not to slag today's music. <laughs> because it's like teach their you own you know every week no, no. we do that but. no I, I i do i end up doing it but not for the reasons that i you know like, oh, i know I, it's like for the yeah, record okay. you do have a profound respect for all genre of music and i say it like just you know like I, I an asshole pers- brother poking but i mean yeah no, no but p- personally it disgusts me but i'm not gonna say it's bad because <laughs> hey they like it yeah you know yeah. like we like like in my got my era my friends we liked hair metal it's crap but we loved it Sure. You know, <laughs> 10 years before they liked the sex pistols. It's crap, <laughs> but whatever, you know, yeah, uh, it inspires. Whatever. It just, inspires. Today, my thing is, is that it's just everything is too much cookie cutter. That's what really gets to me. Yeah. It, it's just that formula. Four guys writing all the same, all the songs for everybody is something like yeah. that. Yeah. But it and works, everybody. right? It sells records it's amazing it does and and paint you know painting that thin line of all right well how much do i want to sell out and how much to in order to sell and how much do i want to keep that artistic vision i mean this is this is an ongoing thing for every single artist and unfortunately only that top cream at the top gets the chance to sort of maybe share their stories yeah, but, and tell us but, how they got but, it done <laughs> not we're, we're jumping off again but like to use a, an example of um there's a song I'm working on, one of mine that Paul's aware of. It's called Broken. What would a 20-year-old, okay, never mind. What would a 20-year-old Good. have in common with what I'm talking about in that song? Absolutely nothing. Sorry, but the fucking hardcore riff that you're blaring out there? No, the no. The 20-year-old but, is just going to hear the riff anyway. And if anyone yeah, listens yeah, to the but, lyrics, it's because well, they're going to see it on the, on, the <laughs> blog, on, the, uh, on the podcast afterwards. Exactly. But you know, you know what I mean? You know, it's like you need a certain level of uh, mileage to understand <laughs> music. You said 10 year old Jenny, right. With your dad on that mandated unexpected, <laughs> I'm going to shock him. And it turned into a moment that where did you go from there? And mm-hmm. I, whether you want to frame it in the, in the, in the, in the storyline of your dad or not, it's really, to me, it's more important not to focus on how that developed musically for you. Where did you go from 10? I mean, you weren't playing gigs at 11, unless you were, and that's <laughs> going to be the next surprise, but <laughs> where did you go musically from there? How did it develop? I was lucky enough that uh, despite my mom not getting the rock and roll thing, she uh, allowed me to take a music lesson once a week, right. um, which was really, really motivating for me to study with college students um, and and learn learn from them and learn uh, to read and uh, learn to sight read and learn to uh, you know get to that point where as a teenager, I can hear a song on the radio and I can pick it up within a few seconds and play along with it, um, which of course, you know, impresses your friends and things like that. Uh, but as a bass player, you can't just go out and play a gig by yourself. You have to uh, go round up your friends and start a band. Yeah, and but everybody's always looking for a bass player. That is the most money-making gig there is. Come on. <laughs> Everybody is always looking for a bass player. But when you're 12 and you can sight read and you can, and 13, and you can play along with any any song on the radio and you round up your other 13-year-old friends who are still playing three, you know, three, <laughs> right. three chord songs in the garage uh it, you kind of don't want to play with them that much yeah. uh, and so uh my mom who just loved me a lot and just didn't get it was like okay so you need something like more advanced right um and she found this this uh you know these sleepaway programs for like advanced musician children who want to play rock music right sent on. me away sent me away to a bunch of those um wow. lucky lucky her she got weeks away from me so it worked out sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay i don't and, know uh, i mean you're, you're being self-deprecating but let's just say okay we'll agree with you for now <laughs> that's the, that's the musician thing to do you know that's that's what we do uh we we humble ourselves through self-deprecation i heard you guys talking about that the other day too not um, guitarists though not, not, no well, sorry and sorry not sorry but yeah, and fucking egomaniac singers especially the ones named paul those yeah. are the ones watch they, out they, man. they humble themselves through narcissism yeah there you go narcissistic <laughs> humility <laughs> nar humility i like to i call think it. i'm gonna get that tattooed yeah <laughs> that'll be like the that. one <laughs> okay 
All right. So you were going to that next step. All right. Exploring. But did the camps do it for you? Did you still feel like there was something lacking? Yeah. What are the camps like? The- that, that's a cool side story. Yeah. That's something that we never did. Phenomenal. Oh. Phenomenal. Absolutely <clears throat> inspiring. It's like when you go to a concert, you know, you go to see a musician who's leagues away from you. And the first thing you say when you get home is, I got to go practice. It's it's that I was so inspired. I love that. I love that. That's so cool. Yeah. And so then I started getting into, you know, fi- eventually finding, uh, you know, playing with kids who are a bit older than I am, like playing with kids who were in college when I was in high school and finding right finding on. my groove and, and playing in a lot of rock bands and things like that. Uh, but then once I got into it and got into playing, I was like, man, this is fun. However, it seemed a lot more interesting to build the band than it was to just do the creative music playing. And so then I got into concert uh, promotion and concert booking and wow, concert cool. concert merchandising. And at, in the you know very early 2000s, I started the first uh, blog in Florida about local music. Good on you, man. Fucking right was- on. And found a way to monetize it right away. And so it became much more lucrative to build the music scene than it became to be in a oh, like, yeah. play in the music scene. And you know, I learned that very quickly. Isn't wow. that the, the running gag that everybody, you know, you forget it's called the music business. That's right. Yeah. Right. You know, the lawyer's the only music. one that gets paid, and all the musicians <laughs> are just scrounging to pay their, yeah. you know, back it's order. Always <laughs> been like that. I yeah. mean, even okay, even now, yeah, you don't need a record label, but you're not making money. <laughs> All right. So this leads me to a sort of what seems like a natural question for me, but you might tell me otherwise. How did that entrepreneurial spirit become something that you recognize? Was that something that was always in you growing up or was it music that sort of hearkened you to say, wow, man, I'm going to totally make some money killing this? Because if you're getting into the behind the scenes and the booking and the, the promoting and the publishing, how did that entrepreneurial bug begin? Was it, was it just in you or did it come from somewhere else? I think it was, I think it's, you know, like, like Gary Vaynerchuk says, it's in your DNA. Um, and so I think it was just like waiting to be unlocked that whole time. And it just took me being passionate about something to really open that door for me and unlock that for me. And I was able to go, wow, I love band practice and this is really fun, but you know what I like more being 15 years old and buying domain names and selling them to local bands and like, and, and awesome, doing things man. and doing things like that. And, and so it was, uh, it certainly, unlock something for me. That's fucking cool. And I went, you know, with the big hand motion because how many times ends is Gary V come yeah, up? Paul's it's a big a constant theme. Yeah. Sorry. If I have two posters that I'll put up first on the wall, one of them is definitely going to be Gary V. Just love that man. Love that we, man. We'll love we have that in common. I love that. <laughs> He's just so incredibly uh, just he gives and gives and gives. And like he always says, I want to be the one to give the most. Fuck yeah. And he yeah. got me out of a lot of dark, uh, convincing myself places in crucial times. So yeah, much respect, Gary V all the way. Um, Wow, man, this entrepreneurial just uh, and creative joining of forces to take on. And as a teenager, uh, that's, I I think it it already sets you so far away from just the norm. You know, we're talking about uh, when we get the chance to hang out with people on this, on this show and we get those unique stories like, wow, I never would have done that. I wouldn't have the guts to do that or I wouldn't have had the, the, the talent or whatever. And to have that at such a young age, sure, you can develop that. Like I'm just I tell my kids all the time when I grow up, I'll have my shit figured out. I'll let you know how it goes. 50 <laughs> it. and still going. It's getting there. And they all would call me the third kid in the family, rightly so, because I don't think I'm going to grow up anytime soon. But it sounds to me like you grew up really young, but you still maintain that kid's spirit. That's a dangerous fucking combination, dangerous combination, because it allows you to see the money for what it is and go and get it and still have fun making it. How does that tie into, I don't know what came first. I don't even know where to start. Like, I want to talk about the wrestling after as the fun reward for this, (laughs) what may be boring shit for you, because I'm just (laughs) thinking, and I saw this, I think it was in the, oh my God, what's the, the, the dude's name? You were an interview, Argentinian fellow. A uh, friend of yours. Oh, nothing but uh, ska. Nothing but ska. Amazing interview. I listened to as much of it as I could, cramming it in in between making content. And I heard one of the comments that you mentioned, and it stuck out. Something about teaching and real estate. You had the choice at the end, you know? And you said they're both fake. And yeah. I love that. And it's still there. It's on your profile. Like, it's still a part of you and who you are. I don't want to, like, drag you into some shitty conversation that clients might see. So I don't want to have to... <laughs> make you say things you don't want to say, but what do you mean by that? What do you mean they're fake? I, I, Remember, we're not live. Yes. Sorry, well, it's recorded. I, yeah, exactly. I, I won't say anything I wouldn't want my students to hear. Um, yeah, that, yeah. 
So, so I have that in mind. I still, I still walk into even things like this with my professor hat on and, and, and I'm mindful of that. Um, but, uh, I think it's, it's kind of back to what you were talking about before about something being embedded in your DNA and being fueled by passion. And those are great things. I like teaching. I am like to think I am a good teacher. I think I am a unique teacher, rather. I think I'm a memorable teacher. And I think that teaching in a way that not every other professor does makes you more memorable. There is, nothing, there is, there is nothing. And being memorable is, is what makes information retained, right? Yep. And, uh, you know, I, and so there's nothing that's like, wow, you know, what's really exciting about flipping a vacation rental. Like there's nothing that's really like, I'm like, wow, I'm so passionate about that. I cannot wait to touch these wood floors. Like I've, <laughs> I've, I've never said that, like, uh, but however, I understand it. And the exciting and passionate part is doing that flip or making that deal or selling at the right time or getting in on the market at the right time. And so the idea of of real estate actually being a part of my identity or teaching being a part of my identity, that's not real. Um, But however, caring enough about my students to go in every day to exclusively help them achieve their dreams in the music industry, that's real. Yeah, well, there's aspects, there's aspects of who you are that are always gonna come across no matter what. Even if you're not, you're not enamored, your passion will come across because it's who you are. You know, so and especially with the students, you're always you're not going to. Yeah, let's fuck them over. No, no. you know, that doesn't seem to be you. I find no. that when the, in, in professional adventures, whether it's career uh, memories, you know, just uh, throughout life and just thinking that and you come across someone who's really good at what they do, they're passionate, they're energetic. They don't quite seem they're like they're in the right place, but they're just fucking good at what they're doing. <laughs> and it's a chameleon syndrome, you know, where you're like, what the fuck are you doing here? Like, can we just talk real for a second? Why do you do this? You should be doing something else. And I can, I mean, I can remember a very distinct occasion of meeting several people like this in like, what the fuck are you wasting your time in this job for? And when they confide in you and say, yeah, you know what my passion really is. And that's when the fun really begins. Cause you never know when partnerships will begin or fucking Twitch streams will begin or (laughs) bands or whatever. And I I can see you having those interesting conversations with passersby in your developing professional life and saying, wow, maybe we should fucking let's, let's fucking beat this shit. Let's leave it alone. Let's go and do something else. Now, here's something that I got to ask you. When you're talking to me about going to the business side of the bookings and the promotions and all of that stuff, and I can sort of see, is there a link there that maybe, is that where the real estate sort of part of your life developed out of? Because it seems to me like that's a great opportunity to say, well, listen, if you're going to the show, let's see what's available where places you can stay and hold, there's another idea. I can make some fucking money off of that one. Is that how it came about? Am I guessing wrong? Uh, I think it, it, uh, well, the first half is right. The second half really, it doesn't have a whole lot to do with the music industry, uh, but it does have a little bit more to do with my, my pursuit of legacy and my, my desire for, for success and, and leaving something behind for my wonderful son and, uh, and building a life that, you know, I don't like taking advice from people who make less money than I do. Not that, you know, but it's, it seems like those are the people in your life that always want to give you money advice, right? Are the people that like <laughs> don't have as much money. It, it always seems to go that way. And if I'm going to tell my students how to be successful, I better fucking be successful, right? And so um, there are plenty, zillions of things you can invest in in today's world. There are all kinds of mutual funds and single stocks and um, NFTs and all these it, it, all these things that you can you can invest in. And I really like investing in things that I can touch and understand and um, and have control over. Right? I can't control what IBM is going to do tomorrow, uh, but I can control what the roof on my house looks like or the roof on that house next door and yeah. things like that. And so that gives me a, a little. It's easier for me um, as just kind of a, a tangible person. And so r- real estate is something I'm heavily invested in. And I think it's something that will never go away, right? There's exactly. always a finite right. amount of exactly. land. Exactly. <laughs> I was just going to say that. It can't, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think the sooner we all get the opportunity, whether we're able to or not, I don't think it's a, it's like a want so much as like, hey, what can I afford to? Uh, as soon as everyone gets to that point where they're like, yes, I'm going to own it instead of rent it. It's such a, it's like, it's, it's like you're beginning a very long uh, legacy journey, right? It, it really yeah. feels like, oh yeah, fuck. I finally graduated. 
mortgage, crap. And then you can start complaining about other fucking problems. But at least when you get there, it's like the, the now the real beginning, right? Getting out of rental mode. There's, you're a fucking force to be reckoned with, Jenny. There's some stuff going on that, it, and even like, I like to say this a lot where we're trying to read between the lines and sort of get to the real, to cut to the chase. There's so much more going on. And I don't think we'll ever be able to get to know the whole story. And I think it's better that way. You're dangerous in a good fucking way. I like you that. You guys I think are that's nice. really wonderful. No, it's fuck. It's Thank fucking cool. Nice Canadian accents. You guys are so ah, nice. Yeah, we're just we have accents. You oh, oh, that's awesome. How cool is that? Awesome. I wonder <laughs> if we were talking to a couple of our Irish his, buddies. His is, and, uh, his is, sorry, wait, wait, sorry to come. Yeah, no. Is Iri- is Irish. <laughs> is Irish. Is ah! Irish. Snig. Got you off. His accent <laughs> is wine. Yeah. <laughs> It is not. Tonight, tonight it's Kunamara. It's a new there you go. Irish. And, mu- and yeah. mine is is coffee crash. <laughs> the coffee crash. Yeah. Uh, we won't go there. There's there's too many fun stories there. But Jenny's gonna be fucking bored to shit. If you aren't already, we're gonna keep keep you focused, man. Keep you focused. Okay. I, I, so, I, are you still in Florida? Yes, right now. Okay, cool. All right. <laughs> This is the only time of year where we even come close to having that temperature that's like, oh, yeah, it's that balmy. Oh, it's just, you know, sweat enough weather. I remember I only went to Florida a couple of times in my life. And I remember the smell coming out of the airport. And I, hot, fresh palm tree air, whether I was in the tourist trap or not. I don't know. It just it had a unique, distinct like there was a flavor in the air and it just smelled like vacation. I just wanted, it's called uh, alligator poop. That's yeah. It. Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, the, the Everglades weren't too far, so maybe that was probably what I was smelling. All right, so the whole journey, my God, I mean, we're not going to harp on the, the stuff that is, let's just call it politely less real, all right? We're going to sure. get away from that because I want to focus on some of the cool stuff. And so this understanding about the business and being the band leader, that's something I get. That's something I totally get, being the one in charge of booking and stuff. I won't say I, I'm not trying to compare. I mean to say, like, there's a part of it that I get. Uh, because I found very quickly when I started doing cover bands, that I wanted to fucking just be in charge of booking the shows. I want to wait. I didn't have fucking patience for that. Like, let's go. We should. We're not. We don't need to wait. We're ready. Let's go play. And uh, Enzo will attest to that. I fucking beat his brow so many times at that, and he's been patient with me his whole life. I don't know how you still fucking tolerate me, bro. I have no idea. But when you get to that point and you're in charge, people look to you. That's the responsibility. And it doesn't sound to me like you're ever scared of that responsibility. Uh, so when did you, when did that bravado sort of kick in? You say, we're going to kick it up a notch. It's going to be like more performance than business because what I know about researching you is the performance and leading up to your experience with the band that you've been with for 10 years. Was there anything before that, that sort of was an experiment of some type that you said, I'm going to start this version of a band and this version until it evolved into what you're, what you're doing today? played in a bunch of bands before this one, um, some that did a whole bunch of mini tours and things like that. A lot of uh, cover bands and wedding bands and corporate gigs and played at theme parks for a long time. I played in uh, jam bands and swing revival bands and wow. uh, uh, just all kinds of things and emo rock and mini hot topic tours and MySpace tours. And oh, my gosh, I've done so many yes. ridic- ridiculous things and I've done cool things, um, you know, good resume topping things like I played. Um, with Hank Williams Jr. on the Monday Night Football theme song. Um, and so, oh, wow, nice. And, and so I've done some, some cool stuff. Um, and so a lot of those required either that bravado of performance, right? Or um, kind of, or even in, in business, just having those significant leadership skills um, and to go out. And there was a point, you know, when I was doing concert promotion in South Florida, um, where I had so many bands interested in shows and so many venues interested in having my shows there that I couldn't do it all myself. So, you know, I was out there in high school trying to round up my stupid high school friends to come help me do it all. (laughs) Um, And so I had to, you know, figure out quickly how to start an LLC. I'm 15 years old, right? And I'm trying to, you know, research this stuff on what would later become search engines. Um, you know, you it was like fucking ask, rock. Ask, ask Jeeves Girl, at the time. Fucking rock. What, was that? Awesome. what were you doing when you were 15 ends? Uh, I can't say. Yeah. Okay. Neither can I. I don't fucking remember. It was not worth telling. <laughs> sure <it laughs> Figuring was. out how I could get into the pub. Try, man. That was it. Fuck the rolling paper. It doesn't go right. Sorry, not sorry for interrupting. We just need to paraphrase <laughs> by saying, wow, you rock. We not so much. <laughs> you get you get into the pub for free if you're if you're 
putting on the, the concert band, group, believe it or not, yeah. are running the show. If That's you're running the concert, awesome. you get into the pub for free and you get to drink for free. Yeah, uh, we've been working for the wrong people, and so that's uh, it's just we all should no, be working you know for what? Jenny's LLC. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, something just clicked. I hadn't even started playing by that age. Wow. Right. Yeah, and you're booking concerts and fucking organizing tours and wondering why your early. high school friends don't have half the gumption that you do and think, well, maybe I should fucking look deeper, look further, find other people. So this is like a hell of a Rolodex you were building back then. Like you say, before internet, prior to all of that. So organized, uh, forward it's a, thinking. It's right there. I mean, there, was, right? there was some internet. It was yeah. just not as it's, robust. It's, but it, it's kind of like the perfect storm. So it's like you have the word of mouth, but you have the resources that are starting to come. So you're like right on the cusp of it. So that's cool. That's a yeah. perfect time. Yeah, we, st- we still had to go out to the venues and pass out flyers yeah. to get the word out about shows and be there, you know, six right. nights in advance, every Friday in advance, passing out flyers. Wow. Um, but, you know, what, you know, 15, there's no place I'd rather be than promoting my own concerts so I could go home with, a you know, personal Fucking cash. Right, man. Right. Hell yeah. No kidding. Good on you, man. Amazing. Amazing. That's cool. So cool. <laughs> so you basically, not only did you pay your dues, man, but you were running the ship where the dues were being doled out and paying the dues at the same time. Such incredible, like, and it's not even a resume. I don't want to insult it by calling it a resume. It's fucking resumes to me. You want something with fake. It's the presentation that you're giving to get the job. And you never needed to have that. And I always admired that from true entrepreneurs that said, I don't know if I can work for someone else. It's, it's better for all of us <laughs> if I don't work for you, because trust me, I'll either take you over or take you down, <laughs> right? The company will be owned by me. I think that's so, totally enviable and uh, we're not hiding it. Enzo and I are absolutely uh, just really like, it's. I think enviable is the best word. I, you know, it's you kind of stuff nice. that we all wish that we would have uh, loved to get a little bit of a handle on. You know, they say, if I knew then what I know now, it's we're st- like we're still growing up we're still growing we, up but we, had we, can, the idea. we can appreciate when the fucking yeah exactly it's not to we, see we're numbskulls I, but. I remember i remember not, not to go too far but i remember sitting at a booth <laughs> in some diner the four of us discussing uh, besides music but in music business and not having a clue what the fuck we were talking about it let's open a recording studio let's do this let's do that you'll be in charge this is us talking with our high school friends. It's exactly the same thing. And no, but not was, going further, not yeah. taking the extra step to get to that. Ah, fuck them. Well, no, it's my this? buddies. <laughs> you know, we have to stick together. Uh-huh. Sometimes friendships are what you need at the time. But uh, good on yeah. you, man. <laughs> but I'm, so I'm a dreamer, too. I've all sat around in plenty of diner booths going, well, what if we and what if we and but that, you know, sometimes it's that group of friends and they're like, yeah, yeah, let's go do it. And then when you're ready to do it, you might be the only one there who's ready. I'm like, all right, here's my savings. Let's go build a business. And they're like, well, my yeah. mom says I have to go to college. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's hard to say it's a letdown, although personally, deep down inside, for sure, it can only spell disappointment because you think, wow, that was someone that I would have gone into business with. And starting partnerships, business partnerships. And Enzo and I have had this conversation where our fledgling just having fun and doing shit, there's a real fucking schedule involved and there's work and there's time to show up and not fucking be late or be drunk or be, you know, fucking make excuses. And we trust each other enough to sort of go that route. And that I don't, hope I don't think I got that there. memo. Yeah, yeah, you got the memo. You told me I can a couple of times. <laughs> and I love the way you play fucking coy. That's the best. And we can we can beat the shit out of each other and still be friends at the end of the day. And maybe oh, make a few bucks together. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> All right. Less about us, more about you, Jenny. Let's get back on focus here. We're not, I, I, I mean, there's so much stuff we could talk about. And uh, I'm going to try and just go with maybe more along the lines of the original itinerary. But we're, we're only, she's only 16. She's running in Florida, man. Come I on. Know, I know. That's why we got to fucking scoot your head somehow. <laughs> so I don't even know, but I don't know where to go with the music questions of the past that I don't know about. So I have to skip ahead to yeah. you watching the movie Clueless. And discovering the mighty mighty boss tone. Tell me about that. Oh How my. did you feel? What was that all about? Where were you musically? Which which were you in a disco, jazz, punk, funk? Oh, yeah, because rock? that's, that's what a band damn were you good question. What and because you played that turn you around? all the styles. You've been playing all the styles while you're yeah. touring and gigging. But what's your personal at that time? What 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 is, inspires you musically? Like in, in that time frame. 
I was a, I'm trying to think of what year Clueless came out. I don't know, like 1995. Um, like yeah, we'll Google it later. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I listened to, to garbage <clears throat> music. I listened to rock radio at the time, right? I, whatever the okay. radio told me to listen to at the time, you know, what was going on then? Weezer, Cake, Radiohead. Um, right. It's, you know, not garbage music, but whatever the radio told me I was supposed to like um, yeah. was, was what I was listening to at the time. And then that kind of changed my perspective because you couldn't, you didn't hear bands like this on the radio yet. Um, there, it had its, it had its day. Um, but that was a, a unique moment for me and something about it just, just struck me and I'd heard nothing like it before. And I loved mm -hmm. the, uh, the kick and brass in your face. And it, uh, was something that stuck with me for a long time. And I always, I always loved the genre, but I didn't start playing in that genre, uh, till much later in my life till I was later into my twenties. Isn't that something? So it took a little while for it to sort of steep and uh, and uh, and gain gain uh, traction uh, in your in your forebrain, right? To be before it became a, a like a project to take over. It makes me think of. I'm just trying to think of uh, punk bands Montreal. Like a, I think of uh, Me Mom and Morgenthaler, one of the oh first God. bands I ever saw. <laughs> And I don't know if you know them. Uh, that's a, an amazing punk with the horns uh, and the fucking uh, knee high, uh, you know, dockers and shit. And my just, God, Paul, is that late eighties though? Yeah, is it yeah, really, yeah, it's, totally. it's late eighties. Yeah, it's late eighties, yeah. early nineties. Yeah. Then there was there was some whatever, but just like twelve piece and. The, <laughs> what the fuck am I? What is this? This is amazing. <laughs> uh, another band from uh, Toronto named the Shuffle Demons, all horns, all brass. And uh, just very much like fucking beat in your face and heavy rhythms. It's just so good. And so t I had the cassette. Like this is the, <laughs> the fucking yeah, yeah. cassette, you know? And that stuff was, it It really, you, if you either, I think, hate it or love it. And mm -hmm. man, we yeah. loved it. And there was a group of us that like, oh, the fuck, we got to go and see these guys. We got to go and fucking support these guys. And uh, when we had time, no, not doing our own shows and stuff. And it's just, it leaves an imprint. And uh, we, on our, one of our recent T-Bar episodes, we checked out uh, Danny Rebel, who's very much uh, into that, more, much more on the reggae side, much more on the, the ska reggae than the, than the, than the, I'm not sure. I don't know what to I call him. What I don't want to insult him, it, yeah. but it's, it's really, it's so unique, but all of it draws into that same boat. And to, and to know that that's where you have ended up in the past 10 years it kind of says something a lot more than what I was expecting because I didn't know about that vast commercial and, you know, gigging experience of all different styles. So what spoke to you the most? What were some of your real heroes after discovering that movie in the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones? Like, where did you go from there when it really started to ferment and say, okay, this is it. This is what I want to do. Or did it happen on the fly? Oh gosh. Are you talking about how I decided I wanted to start a ska punk band or like what happened, <laughs> what happened there musically? Well, in, in fairness, I mean, I know that Tef London, I mean, it, it, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I, I think it maybe didn't necessarily start off that way with that band, but I'm, I'm just like putting words in your mouth here. So you tell me, how did Tef London come about? Uh, and was it a punk ska band when it started off? Yeah. You know, I, I'm one of those people and if you're not one of those people, maybe you know one of these people that if it doesn't exist, God damn it, I'll just make it. Um, and so I saw a, a just moved to to this town and I saw a, a ska punk band and they were like, on the, I was like, oh, finally. And I'd had a, a few to drink. And I was like, oh, I hadn't seen a ska punk band in so long. This was so much fun. They were great. And they're like, cool. And this is our farewell show. And good night to all of our friends. And I was like, I just moved here. What a bummer. <laughs> and I was like, I finally found a really cool local band. And this was their farewell show. And I was like, well, that's dumb. Um, and so I was like, you know what? I'll go online. There's got to be some cool ska punk bands around town. I can check out. This is a big city. Um, couldn't find one in the whole state that I, that was worth salt. Wow. And so I was like, you know what? I play with some really incredible horn players out at the theme parks and stuff like that. Um, and in, in some corporate bands and in a wedding band and, um, outside the theme parks, you know, they got those, you know, shopping walkabout places. Right. And, uh, I was like, we will start a ska band. We will start a ska punk band. Everyone was down. I got pro musicians from the biggest and best theme parks in, in the state of Florida that came that loved uh, this particular bizarrely niche genre that like died in 1998. <laughs> yeah, um, it's amazing, isn't it? It's so, yeah. That's uh, crazy. Which, That's crazy. which still has its uniquely tiny fan base <laughs> that supports our stuff. And uh, it's been a really 
interesting run. But I, I wanted to play Scott Punk, you know, with not the kids who, you know, owned a trumpet in high school. I wanted to play with pro musicians. And yeah. I got that I got that opportunity to play with some of the biggest musicians in town um, and have them come play silly punk rock songs with me. And that was kind of a really neat honor. And it still is to this day. I'm like, wow, you play at Disney World in the Main Street Band and you want to play with me? Like, it's still an honor. All these things all the time. I don't know. I love that. I love that. And that listen, so that cool. speaks a lot about your talent too. I mean, other than the entrepreneurial talent, but your actual musical talent, you don't drag those folks into your band unless you could fucking hold up your end of the, the bargain exactly. on the mic and the bass. I like to think it's the free beer. Okay. <laughs> listen, your self-deprecation is about to wear <laughs> out, man, because there's some freaking compliments that you're going to have to take at some point. And man, it is worthy of uh, like, I mean, they're all, they're all worthy compliments. I think it's, It's amazing that, you know, after all that hard work, and this is something I wasn't aware of, and I've said it already, but just to be able to have, in French, there's a term up here we say, l'embarras du choix. And I guess the most direct translation for that is the embarrassment of choice, right? Having, Mm -hmm. being embarrassed by like such wide variety of selection to choose from. And it sounds to me like, I mean, you worked your ass off or it didn't come just like like this. Um, It really, you know, it's great to be able to say to tap into the talent pool and say you and you and you. Not everybody's got that. And uh, wow, good on you. It's amazing to think that, and this is all just like, and you still have your life ahead of you. You know what I mean? Like there's so many things that you can do and change directions. This is early on. 10 years with a band is a, a huge testament to the ability to keep things together. Your skill as a juggler. And I have done a lot of incredibly difficult things in my life. I have lost a parent. I have given birth to a child. I have made businesses. I have taught the most difficult students in the world. The most difficult thing out of all of those things is keeping a band together. Wow. man, You're here. (laughs) It's like trying to work together with a bunch of uh, just kids that under, under the, under the bind of a marriage, but with no responsibility or expectation. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. So uh, (laughs) kudos to you for that. (laughs) I mean, it's totally understand you can't compliment someone enough for that. After 10 years, 10 years, where are you guys at now? Where is Tef London? If, I mean, if you'll permit, I, we're not running too, too late. I mean, if, if we start to scratch that sort of point where you, okay, you know, I got a boogie, you let us know. Right. But um, I would like to be able to ask about oh, the, the name creation. Oh, 715. I think yeah, there's a problem. Right. Yeah, you might. <laughs> Not adjusted since 2004, just like mine. That's all good. But the um, where, where's the band at Uh-oh. now? Where does don't change it now, man? Because we get right on time for tomorrow's interview. <laughs> you know, there's one tomorrow. Oh, He's shit, that's hilarious. Oh, my God. What? <laughs> made you look. Made you look. All right. So where is Tech <laughs> London at now? After 10 years of incredible success and awesome leadership, where are you guys at now? Things are still going strong. Uh, you know, things are taking a, an interesting turn. We are, we got old um, for one. So it's, but I mean, you guys know, it's not easy to go, to just go out and play a show if you mm. have kids, right? Um, or right. especially if you're a single parent, because the babysitter thing is like a giant pain in the ass because they flake, they're hard to find, they're expensive as hell. And if you add up what you're going to get paid at the end of the night, divided between seven people, I'm like, am I going to break even on this babysitter? Probably not after I tip them. Um, And and so, you know, it's, it it comes down there. How old is your boy? He's three. So he's somebody you can trust. Exactly. So So you need somebody you can trust in there because, you know, he's not old enough to be like, I feel uncomfortable. Um, (laughs) He can, you know, he could cry, but uh, he, he doesn't understand explaining those types of things. So uh, it's a, it's a difficult time and I'm not the only one in the band with kids. So who's also a single parent. So um, it's difficult to just go out and play a show. If we're going to go play a show, it has to be the right show for the right deal for the right amount of money enough to make us go. Right. However, um, it does give us the opportunity to kind of think outside the box a little bit. Uh, so last year during the pandemic times or whatever, uh, apparently those are over here in Florida. So who knows? Um, (laughs) So during the pandemic times, uh, we put together a a pretty cool no effects cover medley that we put out on YouTube that even no effects was starting to blow up on, on their channels. Cause I guess they saw and liked it. So that was cool. Get back, watch it crumble, see the drowning, watch it fall. 
feel just terrible about it That's sarcasm Let it burn Gonna make a toast when it falls apart I'm gonna raise my glass above my heart Then someone shouts That's what they get And so it's giving us this opportunity to kind of rethink what being in a band means for us um, and what that's going to look like going forward. Are we going to be able to do Twitch streams? Are we going to um, investigate uh, how else we can do videos like our, the success that we got with the NoFX one? Or uh, am I going to spend more time doing solo music right now that I'm, I'm stuck at home more? And what does that look like if I do more solo music? Right. Um, and then even having them do come in and do a lot of orchestral music with me has been really cool. We did the A Valiant Fate theme. Right, uh, exactly, yeah. I, I got to have them play uh, orchestral horns on that. So they came in here with tuba and um, uh Class, uh, classical orchestral trombone instead of regular blasting tenor trombone in your face and things like that. <laughs> um, and, and flugelhorn and things like that. So that's been a trip to, to work on orchestral music and maybe explore some of that going forward because it was such a positive experience yeah, doing orchestral music not? with them. Sure. And so and branding took, that for all kinds of applications too. I mean, just for totally. video game music alone, I mean, yes. you got a, such a huge market and it's only growing. I mean, the, the population of the world and countries that are used to be considered developing that are now like online and want that product and those services is just growing, man. I think that's great. 100%. And you're on the money. Like you're reading my mind. I, I want to do, I love doing Tef London and I love playing Scott Punk, but I want to do more and I want to do other things. And I'm at this like weird time in my life where I feel like, like a lid has been lifted off like a treasure chest and I have all these ideas, but you know, I'm, I can only accomplish so many things. Uh, but that I want to do cloning I have, might be a thing to consider, you know, uh, because I'm that so can really it. fucking help a girl out. You know what I'm saying? Let's so have a high for you. Shit, there's shit that would get done. <laughs> so into it. Uh, but I'm a, I'm a list person. I have lists of different things I just want to do musically all the time. And I'd love to explore it with some of these amazing people that I play music with. So um, I don't know. It's kind of like a Tef London renaissance. Listen, after 10 years and all the stuff leading up to that and harboring those relationships and doing the fucking gigs and the hard work, like there's no love loss or anything or, or what a disappointment. How, how come you didn't do 11? Like, what the fuck's wrong with you? You know what I mean? Really? <laughs> no, there's but, nothing to yeah. prove. And you know that. It's just that it's such an incredible achievement. Uh, and it's okay for it to change direction. And it sounds like you're surrounded by a bunch of great people that, I mean, if you've worked that long together, you have such a great understanding it's and you're involving them actively in new projects. Yeah, yeah. It's a pair of comfortable shoes that are still there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they'd love way. to be referred to that way. <laughs> I fucking love you. And you're the best. Italian slippers are even better. I thought you were going to say Italian slippers because that uh, shit is fucking unique, man. Ain't nobody got that except you. <laughs> All right. So listen, you know what? We're not even going to go into the naming myth, or the naming story, although it was fucking cool. And I did see it on your other interview. Or you, heard, you alluded to it a little bit. It's a cool yeah. name. Uh, yeah. But let, let's save that for another time uh, because I do want to ask you, I think this is a lot more important. So tell us about life with Logan. How's that? I am lucky. I think when uh, people find out that I'm a single parent, they're like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm like, no, it's awesome. Like it's, you know, because they, there's that um, there's that stigma of being a single mom. Right. Uh, when people when people found out I was getting divorced, they're like, oh, are you going to sell the house? Like, fuck no. Why would I sell our awesome giant house? Um, and so um, I, I love life with a three year old who is absolutely fearless. <laughs> It's amazing. However, I also have a heart attack like three times a day because he's that kid. That's like, <laughs> let's see how far I can jump off this tree to yeah. my death or uh, want to see me run through traffic like he's that kid. And so I'm always trying to hang on to him and trying to get him not to do some weird evil Knievel stuff. Um, I called you a troublemaker at the top of the show. And when I see the pics of your son on your Instagram feed, I think, oh, man, there is another troublemaker with <laughs> A killer smile and a Jesus. fucking I'm going to take on the world at three. Like you can see it. <laughs> Life as a single mom, like that you take the positive spin. Tell me more about that, because I think more people need to hear that. I think a lot of people think it's supposed to be really limiting, like your identity is supposed to get wrapped up in being a mom because that's who you were meant to be. And that's it. And I think part of your identity can be a mom, but I think you're also 
a woman and a person with meaning and passion and drive and can have your own interest and your own passion outside your children. And I think that's also part of your identity. And it's important that you don't lose it in motherhood or in your child or in being a single parent. Um, and it definitely has its, you know, it's downtimes. There are, you know, there's that saying, well, it takes a village, right? It takes a village. Well, what if you don't have a fucking village, right? Uh, what do you do? I mean, you, you, suck, you suck it up. Yeah. Exactly. You figure it out. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, and that's what it is, but it's important that you still remember that you're, you're a person too, and you can't be lost in that. And I feel really blessed <clears> to have, you know, to love my kid with all my heart and my whole world revolves around him and my heart beats for him, but I, I still have my own things and my own passions and my own legacy to build. That's cool. You're no good to that's anybody it's... unless you're good to yourself and to be able to keep on that legacy of what you've already done and maintain that. I just, I hope it goes on forever for you. Uh, I think it's wonderful. Uh, you know, your, your incredible variety of interests mm-hmm. as if we haven't talked about enough, you right. guys are nice. Where the fuck did D and D come from? Like <laughs> what? Okay, hold on. Well, no, we got to make the garage a little bit bigger here because we got to park the fucking <laughs> the horse drawn ch- carriage comes in yeah. laden with medieval armor and fucking treasure and mimics and fucking beholders. When, where, how, what? <laughs> what edition did you get your cut your teeth on? Like where does that come from? Yeah, I'm excited to talk about this because it's something I am really excited about. And um, I'd, I'm excited that this is how you found me, <laughs> which is which is yeah. interesting, too. Um, Just like, you know, you scratch the crack in the wall of the, the gyp rock and then the whole thing falls apart. And there's a safe behind there and you got the fuck. Oh, my God. I get, look at that. What the hell's going on? A treasure trove of interest. Amazing. You just fucking don't stop. Um, you know, how I joke, Enzo, when I say, when's your book coming out? I'm not even going to joke when I ask that question. I will ask you because you're going to tell me, oh, yeah, I got that in the works, too. It's coming. <laughs> but before we get to that, tell us about D&D. How did that start? Um, it's difficult for me to remember how it started. I'm not a super long time player. I'm not one of those people that was like, oh, I was playing in the 80s. I was playing in the, the early editions and, and things right. like that. Right. Um, I've, I've really only been playing for a few years, but it's something that I wanted to get into for the longest time. Um, I love telling stories and I love using stories to transfer enthusiasm, to teach my students. I think those are the, the memorable portions. In fact, there's a tiny segue. I, uh, I frequently ask my students who have long graduated my class. I've now been in academia for a really long time. Um, and, and I asked them, you know, what, what was the one thing, if anything, that you remember about my class, you know, and, and, and it won't hurt my feelings if there's nothing, it was a long time ago. And, and they say, <laughs> they say, you know what, there's actually one thing that really stands out in my mind. And I say, well, what was it? And I used to tell this story in my class and it, uh, it led to a, a business lesson, but the story itself was this highly embarrassing story where I took my dog to the vet and I split my pants and I didn't split getting out of the car, like not like I was doing something like super dexterous. I was getting out of the car and <laughs> and I didn't split my pants like up the butt like you see in a cartoon. I mean, I split my pants in a U from like the front side to the back side, like Ouch. everything. Oh, and, fuck. And I, but I didn't realize that my pants were ripped. Oh, and come so on, I bro. go in, so I go into the vet and I'm just like, my underwear is just it's, exhibitionist yeah. fucking visiting the vet. Oh right, my but God. I, and I still got pant legs, but then underwear. I'm only like, laughing because nobody died, Jenny. All right. Because nobody nope, died. Nobody died. Real. Nobody got hurt <laughs> except for like my your pride. <laughs> yeah. My pride for like a year and a half. Um, oh, that I, that I mourn. That vet, I mourn. The next fucking yeah, right. you're out of there. Where's another <laughs> fucking vet? Tennessee, God, right? <laughs> <and> fucking <laughs> dog. I've you're never been back to that fucking... vet. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, but anyway, so that was the story. And I told, it led to a business lesson, but I told that story in my class and every single one of my students said that was the thing they remembered was the story about how I humiliated myself. And so I, I you know, it, it was a really, big moment for me to be like, wow, of all the things they remember, it was an impactful story. <laughs> and so it reminds me that if I want to be memorable uh, when conveying information or, you know, trying to connect emotionally, it has to be through storytelling. And so uh, playing Dungeons and Dragons gives me that opportunity to make emotional connection through storytelling, which is turned out to be so incredibly powerful and positive in my life and in the lives of the people that I play with um, and has helped me immensely through even small things like 
overcoming how I'm going to explain a situation in an, an academic setting right. or, uh, you know, having the guts to stand up to somebody who's making me feel like shit in my life. I can just tap into that inner strength of, of somebody else or who's just kind of a little inner piece of me yeah. um, that I get to tap into. And that's so awesome. it, yeah, that's, that's awesome. It that's is cool. awesome. It's powerful. And it, it came about in an interesting way where um, I thought I had what I think a lot of women get falsely diagnosed with, which is postpartum depression right after I had a child. Um, and, and so I was just looking for, for new creative things in my life to help me get through that. Uh, right. turns out I didn't have postpartum depression. I was just in a really shitty relationship. And, uh, you know, once, once I was out of that and free, I just had like this creative explosion and I just wanted to try everything, try every new thing I could think of. I was just so excited and I felt so alive. Um, and, and so I got the opportunity to, to explore all these new avenues and, and now I, I just can't get enough of storytelling and using this as an outlet to connect emotionally in a way that the same kind of way that music does. That's fucking beautiful, man. That is beautiful. When does your book come out, by the way? Um, well, you know, one of the creative explosion things that it, it really got me into was creative writing. It's something um, I never really explored before, but it's something I'm starting to explore now. And uh, as as part of that, I, I my brain is faster than I can type is part of the problem. I'm sure this happens to you guys, too. I just can't get it all out fast enough. Uh, it's like a, like a waterfall, but I have all these ideas and I, I, what I don't have is time, but I have this uh, fantastic start on a fantasy novel uh, that I would love to do one day when I retire and hopefully my child comes and visits me for Christmas. I told you it wasn't going to be a surprise. I knew it. I just fucking knew it. it nothing you're going to tell us is going to be a surprise. <laughs> I will. I fun. just, I want to share one uh, quick uh, anecdote. I, I, I didn't, I played a long time ago, D and D when I was, uh, when I was a kid, you know, I'm talking like, you know, before 10 and uh, the original rules, you know, like whatever the basic, I don't even remember what the edition is. And any D and D nerd, I was going to say, fuck it. They're screaming at the screen right now. And I'm <laughs> sorry, no disrespect. Uh, and then I did rekindle with in my late twenties, early thirties. Um, when I was in the late nineties, early two thousands, I worked for a video game developer for a short time an indie developer and uh, a group of us nerds just got together and said, you want to play some tabletop? I'm like, sure. And I said, D and D right and was, No, we're going to do rune. Uh, I think it was rune quest. And it's okay. like sort of like a very much underground, just, you know, cult niche version of D and D with its own rules. And it's not like D and D. Okay. But All right. Hang on. My friend, Mike walked loves this game rune, the tabletop game. So right. I'm just, I'm going to show him this and I'm going to say, I'm sorry. I forgot the name of your game. I know you've invited <laughs> me over to play. I'm so sorry, <laughs> but we're going to talk about it now. <laughs> Fucking it's nerds. nerds. You're it's, all it's, a bunch of fucking nerds. God and damn it. Proudly so, man. But I got the I got the freaking poster. But the uh, the the game was new to me and in a good sense because there was no familiarity. And so we got a chance to really learn it for the first time. And all of the mythology and the pantheon of gods were like, what the hell is this? And it's very much a more gritty version of D&D, like really, you know, more uh, based in actual, you know, sort of Norse, I guess, uh, style, but not with that mythology. And I can tell you, like you're talking about stories and how they impact you. And I remember thinking this DM is going to give us something and take it away just to piss us off so that we really take this game seriously. And I, because I know the guy and at this time we're, we're young adults, we're professionals, we're marketing people and developing and production, all that. And I was just watching him and I, and it happened and he took our fucking favorite NPC away and like the whole thing, we got fucking serious. Like this, okay. We're, can we meet tomorrow instead of, you know, I'm waiting a week. Cause we need to do this now. We got to yeah. fucking take care of that fucking bastard. Like we're swearing and the fucking beer's going. And the story was so intense. We, we played for, I think, almost a year. And it was really like one of the most memorable gaming experiences of my life. But it bordered on game. It wasn't gaming anymore. It was like, this is another life that we're living. And even though it was on papers and it was just a bunch of dice, I mean, we had so much fun. And the laughing was more intense. <laughs> the borderline tears were all so intense. And, yeah. uh, and I never forget the stories. I never forget the stories. And to watch what you're doing, and creating it from scratch and not knowing all of the incredible stuff that you've already done, knowing that you're a pretty special person, but just like, okay, even more so. 
And to watch you go now, and I watched the whole first episode, I only caught a little piece of the second one. And uh, I love this notion of seeing it from the beginning. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us on A Valiant Fate. We are humbled that you are interested in watching us five nerds play Dungeons and Dragons together. And this is our enthusiastic DIY attempt at a Dungeons and Dragons live stream. Woo! So we here at A Valiant Fate are journeying through the fantasy world of Armadia, a young world on the verge of a renaissance after centuries of war and natural disasters. And our valiant but broken heroes pursue their causes while unearthing the mysteries of the ravaged lands of Armadia. Uh, all right, so with that said, let's go ahead and roll our video. I'm still in the whole fucking pandemic catching up with campaign one and two of Critical Role oh because God. I love the fucking story so much. And I want to drag Enzo into the world of D&D and thinking about maybe having that as another project on the list. Enzo's obvious, always thought I was crazy, but that's the, the, the inspiration for admiring what you're doing. It, it's so genuine because I feel like I'm learning. I'm learning and I know I'm not the only one. I know that there's a lot of other people that are going to be watching this. And going back to the VOD on YouTube and say, I want to catch episode one, the bar brawl and see what happened when, I don't know, when any of the guys, how the fuck did you find such a tall guy? Where did Ryan, like, did he have a growth spurt or something? Is like, is he a natural giant or did that happen by mistake? Like, yeah, where did it's, the, it's the worst that Ryan is so tall, like the worst, because I'm, I'm the short one. I'm vertically challenged. Um, unfortunately, I haven't like grown since like the seventh grade. It's horrible. Uh, so I'm flat <laughs> on, on thing, a good yeah. day. And Ryan is, I don't know, six, four, six, five, something like that. It's the worst. Amen. He has really long legs. They get in the way of everything uh, <laughs> here when we when we record a valiant fate, you know, we've got cables running. We've got mics everywhere. We've got cameras and lights. Ryan destroys everything <laughs> because he has such long legs and such long arms. That's hilarious. Oops. It's the worst. But here I am expecting, and knowing that you're coming from, okay, for, you know, the, the, the uh, envisioning, romanticizing your, your band in Tef London and thinking ska, punk, tattoos and gritty and thinking, who is this crew going to be when she decides to let's get a, cor a corral of fucking, uh, and here are the most gentle faced people on the planet that you just, oh, they could babysit my kids anytime. Never met them. So no problem. So let's talk about Dan. Uh, and Ali and Ryan and John, where did you find these people? How did you guys connect? Where did where did that sort of friendship begin? Yeah, they are nerds. Uh, we don't have a lot in common. I find that I have very little in common with most of the people that I find myself. Well, in Ali's making that very with. obvious with her uh, pop culture uh, quizzes. Oh my God. Which... I'm showing my dungeon master Jenny, who doesn't know anything about pop culture, a slideshow of pop culture. The Rudolph cartoon. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer Goku The Witcher The Witcher Toss a coin to your Witcher The Nightmare Before Christmas What's this? What's this? this did I get any? What, what did I get? <laughs> I got it. What? The Nightmare Before Christmas, really? I don't know. God. I think it's amazing that you're willing to submit yourself to. That's, we should it says just a lot call about it you. Humiliate <laughs> Jenny. They call it Jenny Guesses, but I think they should call it Humiliate Jenny. Because I look through the comments and they're like, oh, was Jenny born under a rock? Was she born yesterday? I'm like, all right, all right whatever. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but this is a great promo tool. It just shows you <laughs> humility. And I think it's wonderful. So yeah, I've interrupted you 50 times. Go ahead. <laughs> we, we, have, we have a saying in Evalian Fate, and that's, if it's not Jenny Guesses, then TikTok doesn't want it uh, for some reason anything else that we post 
like very, very under, you know, under a thousand views. If it's a Jenny guesses, 150,000 views. People want to see me just make an ass of myself, I guess. They want to see you suffer. Yeah, they want to see me suffer. That's a shame. Enzo, any comments about that? TikTok wanting to see people suffer? Is that, <laughs> is that our lot in life? That's the only way we're going to get hits, bro. <laughs> I'm telling you, she's so start tripping. Have, on have your no. kids make you a slideshow, and then you guess what it is, and TikTok will love it. Well, right. well, with mine, it's a little hard because I've brainwashed him, so he he, he can't stand today's music either. Nice. <laughs> you know, he's 12 years old and he listens to Buddy Holly. So oh, I love it. Yeah, the Beatles, the uh, the Stones, all all the old stuff. It's all there, but. He's aware of it because of his friends, right? He knows what that is. So he laughs at me. You don't know what that is. Fuck off. Of course, I don't know what that is. You know, what's wrong with you? See, but going have, back have to them make you a sideshow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but Paul, I'm told you my burlesque routine is going to get hits. <laughs> <laughs> what is at the end of Billy D's episode? You say, yeah, my pole dancing class starts Thursdays. I'd be, you know, it'll be online in no time. I'll get you. I'll, I'll let you know. It's going to get hits like. and get me arrested with all in the same yeah, fucking yeah. shot. That would be awesome. Your wife will love it though. I think she yeah, actually yeah. will enjoy it though. That's the thing. People Take maybe this don't fucking idiot him. out of here. <laughs> Get him out. Make him do shit. <laughs> so as you've been painfully aware, Jenny, I do a fuckload of way too much talking. Enzo interjects with some comic relief, but now I'm going to squarely put this conversation right in the ballpark of where you and Enzo are going to have a real adult conversation. Holla if you hear me. Let me hear. Let me understand that one. Wrestling. That is that is one of my absolute favorite wrestlers too, and so I know. Oh. How, how did it start? And you've met a few. Oh, I've seen the bad. pictures. I've, I've seen. I know. The that's why I said it. Arm in arm. Let it rip. How does, explain how did we that get one there? to me. Explain it to. Okay, so you've always been in Florida. So you started with 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 a a a w. What was it? A, was it WCW back then? What I think was, it was the, I think it was NWA back then. Yeah, it was NWA. Right. So okay. That's cool. <laughs> but yeah, it, it was quickly, quickly WCW when I was a kid. Um, it, that's what was on, on TV that could be found. So yeah. And you know, most people my age are, you know, WWF, WWE fans, right. Um, instead of WCW, but I think I'm always going to be a WCW girl. <laughs> but it's amazing. Who was, how did you latch onto it? Like, you yeah, know, I, I was trying to trying to think about the answers to that actual question. <laughs> <laughs> and and I don't know because I must have been pretty small. However, I remember it being so frowned upon by yeah. my family because I'm because <laughs> I'm this little blonde girl. And here I am. And my my heroes on TV are like the Bushwhackers and like Sting, who's in his, you know, stupid blonde makeup at the time, uh, blonde, you know, bleach blonde hair and his makeup at the time. And, I remember the Bushwhackers. I don't know why. Yeah. I don't know any of them, but I know the Bushwhackers. So, yeah, okay. And, you know, so my my heroes are suddenly these, like, big, giant oafs smashing each other. And, of course, you know, that my family comes, you know, to me and they go, you know, it's fake, right? You know, little seven-year-old me. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, but is it? Like, they're bleeding. You know, you know, you know, like, why not? Why not? Why not just fucking decapitate the Easter Bunny in front of me, too, at the same fucking time? <laughs> but, but I... But you know it it was fake, but it also wasn't fake. Like it's it's real, Listen, but it's not. It, it I in my case it was um, being being the son of uh, immigrants, and they had when they came here the, the, the Italian. My 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 parents are Italian. My dad and all his friends they used to go to the local arena, and they had wrestling, and there was Italian wrestlers from Italy that they knew, so. It grew that way. Like in the 70s and the 80s, it was the local, like, uh, what do they call it? Like the territories in the States, right? Yeah, so there were right. still territories at that time. Okay. So we would get, my dad would take me and I would see like the Road Warriors. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember Maple Leaf Wrestling and or uh, whatever it was in Montreal. What was it called? I remember it's the wrestling. Paul Sylvia Arena or something, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, like, it was uh, there. That's, that's where the wrestling was. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But the way it worked back then is that the stars would travel between the companies right. until there was just those two companies left. Right. Which kind of screwed it up. I mean, I sort of still follow it, but I don't follow it on another, on another one of our episodes. I don't know if uh, you're aware, but when this guy asked me for, let's do a podcast. I'm like, yeah, okay. And then I'm like, who the fuck watches or listens to podcasts? What the fuck? Why do people do this shit? 
So I, I go, let me go research. So now tonight, after we're done, <laughs> I'm going to go upstairs. Everybody's in bed. I'm going to lie on the couch and I'm going to listen to Jim Cornette. Nice. <laughs> That's all I fucking do every night. And that crazy motherfucker puts me to sleep. <laughs> yes. He's so, crazy. <laughs> If, but yeah, the rest, everyone's got their medicine. <laughs> and for me, it was the same thing. It was like going with my dad. So it was like, a, you know, a bonding experience, whatever. And then it was like, you're following, you know, but tell me about Steiner. He's nuts. <laughs> yeah. I hear he's nuts in real life too. Uh, but yeah, the, I, I don't know. There's, there's something about the Steiner brothers that always stuck with me and I'd see them, you know, on, in the, the, you know, at the, when I was a child, it would play in the wrestling would play in the morning um, on, on TV, but and yeah. I, and, you know, I was left to myself all the time. So I would sit and watch whatever was on. And one day I stumbled across this and it was just fascinating. And uh, I don't know why the Steiner stuck with me. It's not like they were from my hometown or had anything that, that really appealed to me. I didn't understand, or even, you know, even before it was Scott and Rick, it was like uh, just Rick and, and the varsity. And, and I didn't. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and so I watched them even before it was Steiner brothers. Um, and I don't know why, it, that stuck with me, but it, it just did something about them appealed to me, you know, um, road warriors, you know, they scared me and, um, mm -hmm. but I was little, uh, but yeah, it was very much frowned on in my life. And, uh, you know, no boy will ever like you if they find out you like something like this and, and stuff like that was, was told to me all the time. So it, I had a falling out with wrestling as I got older um, and became a teenager. It was because it was so frowned upon in my life and it was kind of beaten out of me. Uh, mm -hmm. But then I, then I had the opportunity to rediscover it as an adult. And I had a friend who actually plays Barry Sachs in Tef London who mentioned, you know, that we both watched WCW and we were kids and uh, WrestleCon was coming and it was all of our oldest favorite wrestlers wow, i mean you know right the, cool. the old That's guys cool. yeah. were there and 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 he's like we're gonna we're gonna go and i'm like okay that's fucking cool right on. And, That's uh, a friend. yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's like comic-con but it's it's wrestlers it's yeah. wrestling. and it's yeah. it re really is and they're cool because a lot so of the old cool. guys do show up and even even before that even before i, I we got to go to WrestleCon, i actually got a job i got an internship straight out of college working for mark miro um, uh, marvelous Mark Mero or Johnny B. Bad. Um, and so that was really interesting working on his nonprofit organization, Champion of wow. Choices, which is a really great organization if you cool. get the opportunity to check out a nonprofit that is working towards eliminating teen suicide and bullying in schools. Um, and so that's all he does now. Awesome. Um, yeah. But I had to kind of keep my, uh, you know, my fandom under wraps and be cool, you know. Uh, <laughs> keep it low key, right? <laughs> had, to be, had to be cool. Um, oh, man. That's awesome. That, that, you know what? But I think I, I did the same thing. When you hit your teenage years, you sort of like, eh, whatever. And you kind of yeah. wander back. Now with the 12-year-old, he's discovering all this stuff. And he's like, yeah. oh, pa, I, okay. So it's like I watch it with him a bit, but. No, no I love it's that. never it's the old stuff is for me. I like music. The old stuff is better. <laughs> well, it, you know, it, it changed the stuff that they, you know, could say and do back then was something that you could say and do back then. None of that stuff yeah. would ever fly. Now you can't say stuff like that anymore. No, no, uh, actually, it, no. it, yeah. it would be canceled so fast. Oh, right. if, if any of that were to ever, it wouldn't be even make it. the pilot. Like, I mean, the but rawness was, of the old days, was, just, uh, yeah. This oh, no, but it was nasty. Double edged sword though. <laughs> was, right. Uh, but there was, there was a sense of realism. That's what you got from it. I mean, yeah. everybody, yeah, it's fake. It's fake, but. And also yeah, but a, a very unique approach to storytelling. Um, yes. and, and so I think a lot of that carries over into my technique as a dungeon master and, and as a storyteller, um, especially because they don't know those stories, right? I can, I can play those stories of good versus evil all day and they don't understand, right. um, you know, that things like that, that this is actually just the story yeah, of Macho, Macho Man and Hulk Hogan. Face, exactly, yes, man. yes. They That's don't, awesome. they don't, under, they don't the understand names. the mega powers, right? So I can yeah. do the mega powers all day. Um, and so things like that, and they don't understand Undertaker and Kane. So things like I can do that over and over. You're so brilliant yet so <laughs> nasty. I love it. I just... <laughs> You're a forest man. You're dangerous. You're fucking dangerous. How do you go about deciding to create a pantheon of gods and a world for your friends to play in? Is there a first step? And I won't, I won't even insult you with it. Like what's the right way to do it, but how did you go about deciding? And with, I mean, we don't want to make any spoilers for the players or the fans, but 
where does it start? Where did you decide I'm going to start here? Because there's so many different ways to do it. And I'm just curious, how did you go about it? I think like a lot of young children, I started a fantasy world in my head a long time ago um, with fantasy people who are my friends and uh, fantasy animals who talk to me. And of course I could talk to them too. Um, And now as an adult, it's really cool to get to tap into your, I get to play pretend with my friends again. Yeah, that's what it is really, right? Which is really, really cool. Except there's some, you know, rule guidelines, which is cool because it keeps us all playing the same game um, and play <laughs> and playing pretend together. So it's a lot of fun to get to uh, invent worlds. And I don't know if there is a real starting point, but I, I kind of use it as this really unique tool to honor the things that I love in my life and the experiences and the people who made me who I am. And so my players at the table don't know it, but there are characters in the, you know, the game or or places in the world that are named after my great aunt or they're, they don't know it, but in my mind, they're meeting my grandfather. And to them, it's just some strange old man uh, who is really kind to them and and wants to teach them things and, and help them through their journey. But to me, it's my grandfather or, um, just a unique way to honor the things I really care about and the people and places and stories like in professional wrestling who kind of made me who I am. And this is just one way to pay homage to them in yes. a way that I can give beautiful. it a lot of reverence. Yeah, it's That's cool. Beautiful. I love that. I love that. Just in case people don't know, did you have a hard time deciding whether or not, I mean, is it fully homebrew? Is it based, you know, strictly on a specific rule set of fifth edition? Is there Pathfinder elements involved? Can you tell us uh, D&D English, junkies man. who maybe you're curious to know, like where in the timeline of, is, the, is, the, is it your own making? How much of it is based on rules that exist already? And how much is it uh, of your own making? Core rules of the game, we follow uh, the core rules of 5th edition. Um, We have a couple homebrew rules. A a lot of them are rules that people are really familiar with. A lot of them are rules that are just based on my own experiences playing the game. Uh, For example, I don't allow uh, my players to be animal races. Like They cannot be tabaxi. Um, And that's like, well, well, why is that? And I think it's because... In playing in this kind of male-dominated game, I've had so many weird experiences where people want to act out some weird like animal thing that I just I don't I don't allow that to, to come into my game anymore. I've just learned it's the not hard about way. That. Right. right. Yeah. And it's not that I think that any of my wonderful players would ever do such a thing. Just I was to gonna say I don't expect that from that gang <laughs> at all. Right. But yes, they're they are um if the IPA the, the is sweetest. flowing, it things could get, the, and it's going to be Ryan's <laughs> fault. I get it. I understand. Right? No, no. Ryan is, <laughs> is extru- incredibly wholesome. I know. I'm just picking on the nice guy in the batch. They're all, they're all just wonderful people. So yeah, I mean, it, it's, really it's cool. great to see you guys go. So, okay. So it's basically steeped in the fifth edition rules with a little bit of homebrew content. And yeah. the, uh, the, 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 the pantheon of gods, was that something that you had to decide beforehand? Or are you going to evolve as it goes? How, how is that working out for you? I took a page out of Matt Mercer's book on that one, and I took a selection of Forgotten Realms gods that are staples, and then I also created a homebrew set, and I kind of mashed them together. Right um, so I have a, a big mixture of gods that our audience are going to be very familiar with and a set of new gods that I think are going to uh, inspire the audience and say, wow, I never thought they're there could be a domain for that. That makes sense. That's really cool. Um, I wonder what their worshipers are like, or I wonder what their cults, cultists are like. And so I think that's going to be uh, a unique surprise when we get to it. So, uh, but I, I took a page from the best on that one. It would be very difficult to come up with a massive pantheon of gods or, and I didn't want to have a world that was limited in any way either. Right. So right. I didn't want to say, well, these are the five gods and that's it. It's, it's such an incredible amount of power that you wield as a DM. Uh, and it, it can be to, to, I mean, if you're not prepared for what the, pl- what the players are going to throw at you, then it can also be your downfall. But it just seems like you're surrounded by such a great group. Tell me a little bit more about this gang. Is there anything that you can share with us without giving away anything you know, crucial? Is there something that's maybe like a teaser that you can tell us people can look forward to where you are now in the campaign? And keep in mind, this is something that we're only going to be releasing this episode probably in a few weeks. So what you say now may have already happened or may not, depending on their character choices. But is there something that you can sort of just drop the teaser carrot and maybe 
say, well, watch out for this. It's to come. I think we're going to see a lot of our players' backstories unfurl when they're not ready to release their secrets um, in, a, in a way that the world is going to force their hand. So before I grab your guys' initiatives here, uh, Silas, as you feel the claws sink into your skin, you see this form of the old woman start to fade away into the water. And instead, it looks gray and slimy and it smells awful. And you see a massive frog-like creature dripping with ooze emerging from the water. Oh, that's not a lady. <laughs> White light from the <laughs> orb starts glowing in the runes and then dances up Arburn's body, centers on his chest and shoots outward towards the frog-like creature. Great. Something new every day. He's yes. got a chest so ray. It's a con save okay. of DC 12. From here, it looks like you can. I can't, I can't see the squares, but I mean, you're right up on them as it's far like, as I can tell. Mm -hmm. The bases are like half a square apart. Okay, I say you're good enough. Okay, thank you. You're kind of benevolent. I am kind of benevolent. Um, all right, so I am raging. You can uh, follow me that. on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to attack recklessly. And so I think that'll be fun and unique. You know, a lot of Dungeons and Dragons stories, they deliver a set and hard plot and your players are railroaded down this path to complete the story, to solve these missions, to finish these quests. And this is, while, while it's still, you know, player driven and they drive the story, it's also um, character backstory driven, really. And so the story is, cool. is them. Yeah, That's it's really not... Cool. It's not me forcing them into a story where it's okay, this this is them, it's good versus evil, and that's it. We're gonna defeat the dragon, save the princess, we saved the world. Um, it's much more of in order to save the world, they're going to have to defeat their own demons. And what does that look like? I love it already. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's safe to say that we were fans as soon as we discovered your stream and to find out all of these cool fucking things about what you have done and what's to come. Jenny, you're just an incredible force. And uh, we're so happy to have had you on the show before Thank we you. even let you have the opportunity to leave this particular interview. If you can call it an interview, it's more of a conversation, but I got to ask you, where do people go? Where do you want people to go online to find out about you, to support what you're up to a valiant fate or otherwise We'll take care of all the URLs. So you just tell us the platforms and the channel names and we'll take care of the rest. Where do you I want people to I love it. I love it. And thank you guys so much for having me. This has been a lot of fun and really, really cool to talk to people that I feel like I have so much in common with. Um, so uh, check out A Valiant Fate on Twitch uh, at A Valiant Fate, twitch.tv slash A Valiant Fate. I'll let you guys take care of all that. We're also on TikTok. If you want to watch me guess stuff that I have no idea where every guess is Naruto because I don't know. Um, Go ahead and check us out on TikTok at A Valiant Fate. We're on Instagram at A Valiant Fate. It is going to be a really, really cool story that was started because I couldn't find anything else like it. Uh, if you want to check out a really cool ska punk band at Tef London Ska, um, just about everywhere, check us out on Spotify. We'll be happy to uh, have have new ska punk fans because there's so there's so few of them out there. Uh, but we'll be happy to to rock with you anytime. I'm on Instagram too at Jenny Morrison versus the world, and let's be friends. That's fantastic. We're going to take care of all those links. If you're watching this and if you're seeing a highlight of the show, <laughs> that's the one, man. That's the one. Be sure to put the links in there. And I, and I know that at least one, if not two or more of your players in A Valiant Fate are sort of doing their own merch projects as well. So maybe I'll uh, collect a few of those links and put them in. But most and for, foremost, first and foremost, what I'm going to say is go and support Jenny Morrison, an absolute force to be reckoned with, guys, and seriously, more to come. I don't think there's anything that I would be surprised to see from you in the future, but you got a couple of Montreal fans for life here and uh, continued success in what you're doing. You're just on such an incredible path. Way to go, man. Way to go. Don't stop what you're doing. Enzo, there's when does the uh, pole there's dancing question. class there's begin? Oh, oh sorry. Okay, you have an actual question. Fuck, man. Yes. Go for it. Do it. Where, where does No Doubt sit in your pantheon of ska, reggae, something or other, maybe fake or not fake bands? I think, uh, you know, they were really influential in bringing ska to the mainstream. And I think it would have never found the amount of success that it did without No Doubt. So I think okay. ska fans everywhere owe them a huge debt of gratitude and kudos to them for being able to evolve and stay at top of the charts 
you know, it's 25, 30 years later. For them, man. You know what? When, when I was thinking of it, I'm like, when was that? Oh, that was just like 10 years ago. I'm like, oh man. It's like, how old's your fridge? Ah, five. Wait oh, a second. Fuck. I've had it for no. 30 years. Yeah. Wait a minute. The silver it? handles still think? hip. No, I mean, yeah, that doesn't, no. no, it's not good anymore. Right? <laughs> but, but, but I mean, I think Scott, I mean, you could say the clash had a little bit of scar on them. The police had a bit, you know, it's yeah. been around forever. You All know, right. I know a really awesome Canadian ska band. I don't think they can leave Canada because they did something bad. Oh, no. have, you guys heard of, have you guys heard of the Planet Smashers? I do. Yes. I know the name. I don't. Okay. I mean, I've never seen them, but yeah. I know awesome the name. Canadian ska band. They're like a party ska band. Right. Uh, ah, and cool. I, yeah, yeah. I, okay. I don't. I don't know where they're from. Somewhere in Canada. There's. It's Canada's huge. Um, <laughs> it is. I, I think people. Huge you know, country. Not too many people. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's it's a giant place. Uh, so somewhere in Canada, but I don't think they can leave Canada anymore. So you guys are stuck. With them. That's fucking oh, that's hilarious. Cool. Let's check that out. Okay. You know, in the meantime, listen. Continue success. Keep on what you're fucking doing. It's awesome. Thanks for Jenny Morrison, in. fantastic to talk with you. Enzo, amazing. you know, you're not so bad. You're all right. You're okay. I wasn't I mean, talking to you. Man.